Good afternoon. I am the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, and I have the privilege of serving this congregation as its minister. Please know that whoever you are, whatever you believe, whomever you love, and whether you're joining today in person or via Zoom, you are welcome. We gather today to celebrate the life and mourn the death of Chuck Harris. Chuck was a son, a brother, a father, an uncle, a teacher and colleague, a musician, a volunteer, and a friend. He was also a complicated human, and as most of us are, and as such, he leaves a complicated legacy. The task before us today is to give shape to that legacy with compassion and also honesty, naming the hard parts and celebrating the joyful ones, that we might release pain or regret and carry forward the best of who Chuck was and what he offered the world. Now, to be clear, we're not going to complete this task today. This is a way station, not an ending point on a journey of loss. However, there's power and potential for healing in the gathered community and in shared remembering. A few housekeeping details. There are bathrooms just through those doors, past the elevators and to the right. After the service, there will be a reception downstairs in our fellowship hall, and we hope you'll join us. Last but not least, today's service is being streamed on Zoom for pe people who are attending from other locations, and we'll be recording it. So please let us know if you'd like us to share the link um, with you or with anyone else, or, or with anyone not available to join us today. Peace be with the house and all who enter herein. Come into the circle of memory and hope. Come into the circle of mercy and forgiveness. Come that we may share our grief and our strength, our courage and our love. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing, There's a River. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Chuck Harris was born on November 3rd, 1949, not far from Wilmington, Delaware. His dad, Charles Harris Sr., was a nuclear chemist. His mom, 
Dorothy Alice, was a music teacher and stay-at-home mother who became a social worker after her children grew up and left home. Chuck was the second child and the oldest boy. His older sister Kathy was born in April of 1947, and his brother Terry was born about a year after Chuck. Wendy was born about a year after Terry, and Chuck's youngest sister Pam came along four or five years later. Chuck spent much of his childhood on the family homestead in rural New Jersey. The property was forested with a nearby creek that had a rope swing and a big log that the boys liked to use as a dramatic setting for sword fights. They built a tree house, and they got into some trouble, as boys are wont to do, setting fire in a vacant lot and rolling down a hill into a nest of mud dauber wasps. Harry had to go to the emergency room after that one, and the doctor said that one or two more stings and he might not have made it. The cousins would visit and the whole tribe would play softball in the backyard. The youngest cousins, Pam and Cousin Terry, remember with fondness the way Chuck would pretend to be a monster and chase them around the house. The family played a lot of games and sang songs around the piano. They loved camping in the Adirondacks, Maine and Canada, sometimes setting up on a lake shore in order to facilitate daily canoe trips. The family got lots of compliments for being well-behaved in public, but there were some challenges at home. Both parents were worriers, and Chuck's mom struggled with depression and sometimes with regulating her anger. Chuck developed a scary temper as a child in addition to depression and anxiety. Now, I know that there is a stigma attached to mental illness, but there really shouldn't be. It oughtn't to be any more awkward to name Chuck's emotional struggles than it is to talk about his battle with cancer later in life. Chuck was pretty open about it himself, especially in his later years, and it's only by being open that we can make sure that everyone gets the support that they need. In any event, Chuck left home to go to school at a fairly young age. He attended his father's alma mater, Andover Prep. He studied far hard but found the atmosphere and the expectations somewhat oppressive. When his brother Terry arrived, socially adept, roller skating around the dorm, and managing to get himself expelled, Chuck secretly felt a little jealous. Still, he excelled academically and then went on to Oberlin, where he got a BA in English. He enjoyed Oberlin much more than Andover and loved singing and dancing and musicals. He was part of a choir that performed at the National Cathedral in honor of those who died in the Kent State shootings. He then went to Colorado State where he received a master's in environmental studies and the University of Michigan where he got his PhD in natural resources. During college, Chuck hitchhiked across the country with some friends and fell in love with the West. He worked at Yellowstone Lodge, rafted the Grand Canyon, and spent as much time as he could out in nature. Professionally, he taught at Purdue and then Oregon State before landing at the University of Idaho in 1984. Personally, he married Chris in 1979, Sarah was born in 1981, Charlie in 1983, and Patrick in 1987. Even though Chuck's anger and unpredictability could be an issue, the young family had a lot of fun together, camping, cross-country skiing, sledding, and spending holidays with friends. They attended this church regularly, and in addition to singing in the choir, Chuck was proud to be one of the power tools, <laughs> the men's answer to the hot flashes. I tried to come up with a sentence to describe the power tools and the hot flashes and really just couldn't, so <laughs> I think you had to be there. Chuck coached and organized soccer and basketball teams. Every two years, they took a road trip east to visit with family. There was a lot of music in their home, and he supported all of the kids playing their own instruments. Chuck loved reading bedtime stories to his kids and he and Chris loved live music and dancing, and even took lessons in Western Swing, though that was many years later. 
The family moved from town to the base of Tomer Butte and then to Paradise Ridge. In addition to contributing at church, Chuck was involved in the Moscow community, volunteering his time in the weeks leading up to elections, participating in education committees, and working on the efforts to prevent the Department of Transportation from rerouting Highway 95 over Paradise Ridge. And you may not know this, but Chuck actually attended seminary while on sabbatical from 1992 to 93. Now, somewhere around that time, Chuck's mental health took a turn for the worse. Stress and challenges at work compounded his lifelong struggles with depression and made him increasingly unpredictable and unsafe at home. After a few years, he found a better balance of medication and counseling, which improved things a little, but the most impactful damage had already been done. Even so, the family picked up the pieces and continued to have some fun times, especially family reunions with Chuck's family on the Jersey Shore and Thanksgivings on the Oregon Springs. Chuck and Chris made multiple trips to the Portland area with the boys. Even more challenging times came in 2011 when Chuck had a brain infection that required major surgery. After surgery, he mellowed out some, and the intense anger dissipated, but he lost a lot of his laughter and struggled with a deepening depression. In 2014, he and Chris divorced. His relationships with the kids were up and down, and his mental health made it difficult to maneuver these fragile and fragmented connections. I remember the first day he came back to church not long after he got his cancer diagnosis. He looked sad and scared. He stayed in the back, and left right after the service was over. It took a couple of weeks before I finally got back there fast enough to meet him, and a few weeks more for him to ask for the support he needed to get through his treatment. Many people in this community took turns driving him to Lewiston for chemo and radiation. Can I see a show of hands? How many of us drove him down? Yeah. Um, when I took my turn, it was the first chance I had to really talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. He was in a pretty rough place, but he was also really willing to listen and learn and change. Over the next several years, I watched Chuck struggle to heal physically, mentally, and emotionally. He started to sing with a choir again, and he paid such close attention to the sermons. He'd ask me for copy, copies, and then he'd ask to meet for coffee to discuss them with me later. Once his treatment was done, he started actively looking for ways to give back and served in many key roles here at the church, from facilitating the men's group to leading discernment circles as we figured out what to do with our building to sitting on the committee on ministry. He also loved, loved volunteering for Habitat for Humanity. The pandemic was rough on Chuck between the isolation and the persistent and horrible pain in his jaw, which had turned necrotic. He lost his sister Kathy in 2017, which was devastating for him. And when his brother Terry died in 2020, he could barely face it. He talked a lot about how he'd lost his mojo. He spent a lot of time researching genealogy and reading history books that provided context for his ancestors' stories. He continued to volunteer here at church. Just weeks before he went on hospice, he shoveled snow for Victoria Seaver after she had her knee replacement. He felt like he couldn't fix things with the people he loved most, so instead he just engaged in smaller acts of love as often as possible and with as many people as possible. Now, don't get me wrong. He could still be persnickety. He was adamantly opposed to getting screens in the sanctuary, and he lobbied against them hard. <laughs> But I want to share with you this text that he sent me after Paul Disciples' memorial service. He says, I take back all my negative reactions, my concerns, and my hesitations about the video screens, cameras, etc. Given these long days of my being bedridden, I'm feeling truly fortunate for the opportunity to continue this further building and strengthening of my community of faith and love. Despite multiple therapies, Chuck's jaw um, continued to deteriorate. He started losing teeth. He was in terrible pain. So when he decided to give up the fight and go on hospice, I couldn't blame him. 
When we learned that the cancer may well have come back and could be the reason for his unresolvable and unbearable pain, it was even possible to think maybe he made the right choice not to undergo the long, painful, and dangerous procedure that had been presented as his only option. This community accompanied him during his last days with so much grace and generosity. And I hope his family took some comfort from knowing that they weren't the only ones loving him at the end. I hope and pray that Chuck finally forgave himself and relaxed into the love that surrounded him, the love that he had cultivated. He certainly talked a lot about love and about the importance of both acting and speaking in loving ways in the last few weeks of his life. When they were able to control his pain, I saw lightness and a joy in him. I like to think that after we die, we're welcomed home into an unconditional love that's more perfect than the ones, than the love we humans try to offer each other here on earth. I like to think maybe he got a glimpse of that abundant and perfect love. In any event, may we learn from his mistakes and carry forward the parts of his legacy that were loving and generous. May we remember him with tenderness and affection and may we strive to be just a little kinder toward ourselves and toward one another. Amen and blessed be. And now the choir has a gift of music for us.
Thank you so much. And now I'd invite David Kramer, Chuck's nephew, forward to share a few memories. My name is David Kramer, and um, I'm Chuck's nephew. Uh, my mother, Kathy, who passed away from cancer back in 2017, was Chuck's older sister. And as sometimes happens with aunts and uncles and extended family, you don't soften. Um, we generally got a chance to see Chuck on, on summers when we had family reunions, primarily in, in New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore which were always very special times. Uh, I'm not going to talk really about those, but I'm going to read a, a poem that was very meaningful to Chuck. But I mentioned the reunions because the photos on this table, if you haven't already had a chance to see them, I would urge you to do so. That is the Chuck that I remember. The huge smiles, the wicked sense of humor, the joyous laughter, the best parts of Chuck. And that's what I'm going to remember. And I feel very honored that Chuck made a pursuit in his life of, the, of investigating the genealogy of our family, going back, as far as I know, to the Mayflower and coming over from England. And I'm grateful and honored to continue that because I think family is incredibly important and knowing where we came from and what is in our history is a part, part of who we are and how we see our own lives. I certainly do. So I won't do anything other than just read this poem, but again, I urge you to, to see the photos and spend a moment with that. I think that's the Chuck I remember. So this is a poem, that, uh, or a, a, an excerpt, I should say, of a poem from Mary Oliver. It's a, it's a poem called In Blackwater Woods, and this is just a, a piece of it. But I, I know that Chuck wanted this read today. This, oh, we are? Okay. There you go. So you're going get to it, get it twice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so again, this is just an excerpt. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads me back to this. The fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Thank you. Chuck's sister Pam is going to share with us now. I'm also going to read a quotation um, that my brother really loved. I started, I noticed him maybe when in, in his mid-twenties. I saw this was on his wall wherever he was living. And I noticed through the years that wherever he lived, this quotation was always there. And it's 
a quotation from um, a book, um, The Once and Future King, about King Arthur, and, um, and it was by T.H. White. And um, I'm reading it today because to me it hits my brother all over. <laughs> um, the best thing for being sad, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn something. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by lunatics and evil or know you're on a trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. That is the only thing when the mind can never exhaust, never alienate, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. I remember my brother teased me once because I said something about, well, a counselor that I had worked with for years um, said something about, we were talking to her about how deep the bond is between siblings and why that's so, or at least between many siblings. And she was talking about how you share the womb at different times, of course, but you share the womb. And Chuck thought that was kind of funny, but it, but it, it's, it's, I, you know, I think that's really true, that I loved my brother to the bone. I loved him absolutely, always. I miss him every day. I always will. Um, there were many times when we were estranged, sometimes because of my fault as well, or his. But we always came back together, and we had a lot in common. We both loved music and reading and we, um, out the outdoors and movies, <laughs> and um, we, I had a lot of good memories from um, the years he and I went hiking together in Colorado and Utah and, and stuff like that. Um, anyway, um, the one thing in that poem that, or that excerpt from that book that it doesn't talk about is, is the gratitude that Chuck felt, um, especially toward the end of his life. And um, I know he felt it, and I know that you folks in this room and you folks in this community, lar the larger Unitarian community, um, were a big part of, a big part of that. Um, and I just wanna thank you all. Um, during the last few months, it's been tough. Um, seeing my brother go through so much pain and having trouble getting help with it that was adequate. And, um, but you people here and in the community of the Unitarian Church, um, really, you brought my brother deep, deep happiness and peace um, at the end of his life. And, um, gratitude. And I guess I already said that. Anyway, um, I wanted to thank you all so much for everything you did, whether it was <laughs> cleaning out my brother's apartment or baking things for today or, or, or just, and then of course most of all, all the people that came and visited him during the last few days and read poems to him and talked with him and just sat with him. So he wasn't alone, and I know he didn't feel like he was alone at the end, and that was what was most important to me. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Chuck's sister, Wendy, is also going to share a few words.
Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy. Um, I've been going back and forth about whether to speak or not. Um, I had a I had an incredibly difficult relationship with my brothers growing up, and even as an adult. And I really didn't even get to know him much um, until this last year. Um, it was after my other brother, our other brother died, and it affected him deeply, um, as it affected all of us. And we, you know, as, as the remaining siblings decided to get together every Sunday over Zoom and just talk with each other, just get to know each other. And, um, but for my sister, you know, Chuck and I had already just gotten to, into, I just turned 70. And um, he was in his 70s. And uh, it took us all those years to come together. Um, but this is what I wanted to say. Um, there's an old saying that nobody's perfect. And my brother, Chuck, wasn't perfect. In fact, he was far from it. As one of Chuck's younger sisters, I grew up with a boy who was intense, angry, and often physically violent toward me. Um, I didn't understand it, but I learned to live with it and be silent about it. I never spoke out loud about many of those things that happened when we were young. Um, Mostly because in the early days of our family, you, you know, it was the 50s, and uh, you simply didn't talk about certain matters outside the family or even within the family. Um, you didn't talk about personal issues, and you especially didn't talk about health issues. Um, back in those days, men were nothing if they weren't strong and, and invincible. That was the role model that was established for my brothers both my brothers. And likewise, women were expected to be quiet about themselves. Our mother never talked about the physical pain of childbirth or the emotional pain of postpartum depression. And thinking back on it now, discussion of any feelings at all was conspicuous by his abs. But whether it was said or not out loud, it did not exist. My brother had a mental and chemical imbalance from very early childhood and throughout his adult years. During his teens and 20s, he would suffer long bouts of depression, offset by episodes of uncontrollable rage. I was afraid of him. I was. And I grew up afraid of him, and I grew up afraid of men in general because of my experiences with him. And, you know, and he was, he was known uh, for saying the quiet part out loud, whether anyone wanted to hear it or not. Um, I always wondered growing up why he was the way he was toward me. And because um, it didn't seem to affect my other siblings, my younger sisters to a later degree, but it didn't affect my other siblings. And I came to learn that um, my mother had a very, very difficult pregnancy with my brother, and that she was given hallucinogenic drugs as she gave birth to him. And I, you know, I don't know whether that's the reason why, or whether it was just simply genetics, but my brother wasn't a bad person. He was ill. He had mental illness. And the truth that Chuck lived with every day of his life, the secret was that depression is real and mental illness exists. In everyday people living everyday lives, Chuck was one of those everyday people, and he spent his entire life trying to find some peace. One way he tried to miss by educating himself, as my sister referred to, Learn all you can. 
He studied the great philosophers of the world. He studied the great religions of the world. I mean, he really, you know, he entered a seminary out of a thirst for meaning, you know, and, and a desire to understand the world around him and his reactions to the world around him. He sought truth to know it and to have it known by others. He became a teacher. And in doing so, he tried to find some measure of understanding and where he fit in the world. But with all of his searching, when I finally began to realize that my brother had changed, it was when he found his way to all of you. Somehow, he hit his body. Um, to um, see that that he wasn't alone and that he had choices. Um, he found his faith again through you people, all of you. And it's where he learned the power of giving and the power of forgiveness. My brother, when I was 70, several months ago, called me out of the blue and he asked if he could speak to me. And I said, sure, what, what's up? And he asked me about something that had happened when we were children. And he asked me if what had happened was true. And I said, yes. And he asked me if I could forgive him. Um, and he was clearly suffering with this. And I didn't want him to suffer anymore. And I told him so. And I know how genuinely his, his expression of his desire for forgiveness, I know how genuine that was. It was only he and I on the phone, but he meant it. And I loved him for that, and I forgave him right away. And I let go of the past. Here I am 70, and I finally was able to let go of the past and begin to live my life, too. So I think he could not for you. You gave him so much strength, and I'm grateful for it. And he loved all of you, and he was grateful. So thank you for coming today. And if you have people in your life that are suffering, reach out. Reach out. Thank you. Sarah. Hello. This is, oh my gosh, it is so amazing to be back in this, this sanctuary. This was the first time that I've, I've seen the new, my dad was so excited about the renovations and all the work that he did and, and helping with that. And you guys, yeah, it looks, it looks amazing. I just have so many good memories from the sanctuary and yeah, and all the changes just look incredible. <laughs> um, I um yeah, I mean it's been it's been over twenty years since I've been in here. And I know and the funny thing with the screens is my dad and I had many conversations about those and he uh, and I've in my churches we've actually we have screens we've had screens and I told him that it wouldn't take away from the sacredness that it could be done. Um but and it and it really doesn't. Like it still feels very special in here. Um, I think, you know, my, we've, we've talked a little bit, we were, not a little bit, we, but we've talked about the struggles that my dad had and, um, a lot of his, his worst episodes were when my brothers and I were children and there was, there was trauma and deep emotional wounds and, 
it often really felt like he put on a really different face for the outside community and his and the extended family than he did for for his immediate family um, and in more recent years as he's become more aware of what had taken place he's just he had really great difficulty navigating and enjoying really just enjoying our family being together um, as well as repairing those relationships but as those of us with loved ones with mental illness know the person is so much more than that my dad did countless positive things as a father and had many strengths that my brothers and I carry today. His intellectual intelligence and curiosity and love for learning, his love for the outdoors and conservation, his love for books and reading, his compassion and care for others, and his love for music and his musical abilities. Although I didn't get the singing voice. I was, um, I was the one who my parents said, we can't believe how off key you sing for how well you play musical instruments. <laughs> um, so I did not get the singing one, but I still sing a lot even to my, to my husband's chagrin. <laughs> um, music remains a huge part of my brothers and my lives. And in some of my dad's last days, we listened to music together. And sitting at or near his feet, I could see that his toes were continually tapping out the beat or making their own harmony. And I do this with my toes too. And I never realized where I got it from until I was sitting. Last night, I was looking at the photo show or the photo slideshow that you'll see in a little bit. And it is mostly from our family reunions and that were on the Jersey Shore. And it really struck me how big my dad's smiles were and how happy he looked. And in a text from a close family friend right after he passed, she said how she would always remember his loud and joyous laughter. And I had, I had forgotten about that a little bit because around the time of the brain infection, or because of the brain infection, the smiles and laughter had faded. And, but then it was also the ones that same surgery that lessened his intensity and made him feel safer to be around. But it really reminded me how he was really known among our family and friends as a jokester who loved being silly. Even after things, were, got, things shifted around with the brain surgery, he continued with a quiet strength and determination that carried him through the cancer and the more recent years of physical pain, and he has given us that same strength and determination. He carried on when many others had given up, or would have given up, I mean. And this, but this church was really my dad's happy place. And the most re in recent years, the times when my dad really seemed the happiest was when I was talking with him on the phone and he was telling me all the different things he was doing and all the different coffee dates he had lined up and he just, he, this, was his, this was his special place. And he loved you all so very much. Thank you. So given that we've already heard um, in Blackwater Woods, do we, do we want to hear it again? Yeah. OK. Does one, do, do, do you want to read it, come up and read it again, David? Do you want me to read it? We could read it all together. Why don't we try reading it all together? The words will be up on the screen. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss whose other side is salvation 
whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. And now we have some remembrances offered from friends and community members. Dennis? Good afternoon. I'm Dennis Becker. Chuck was my teacher. So I arrived here on the Palouse in 1997. Chuck recruited me to come here to work with him. And I have to say, we got in a few scrapes. He and I, sometimes. But 
he and I were also in cahoots in a lot of ways in, in working on the things that we did, working in the environment. And so I was thinking back through some of the stories, and one thing that really sticks with me are the lessons that he left me. In it was early 2000s, he and I and a group of researchers were um, working with um, salmon. We were looking at uh, breaching of dams and how to recover salmon in this region. And um, Chuck and I and our colleagues uh, spent hours working together um, to prepare ourselves to um, go out and to meet with communities to understand how, how they would be impacted. And, and we walked into these communities there might be a hundred protesters outside yelling at us, and just these very emotionally charged environments and, and situations. And Chuck always approached it with such poise and, and strength. I mean, behind the scenes, we were all losing it. But he 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 taught me bravery. Um, that was those were hard situations, and and I I so appreciate what. Even though I didn't always agree with him uh, as a student, um, I really appreciate it. So in 2015, we moved back to the Palouse. We were uh, members of this congregation. And that was a new phase. That was a phase for Chuck and I. We shared stories, we laughed, we shared heartaches. He was my friend. He taught me forgiveness. Chuck and I also shared a strong bond around football. <laughs> he was an Eagles fan. I'm a Chiefs fan. And not so long ago, just before he went into hospice, um, I invited him over for Super Bowl Sunday. He wasn't feeling good. He wasn't feeling up to it. But we spent the entire day bantering with each other <laughs> and, and giving each other a pretty hard time. All in, all in good friendship. Um, and I think it was then the end of his life. I realized just how good of a friend he was to me. So for you, Chuck, go Eagles. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, good. Um, a few weeks ago, I uh, was, was helping uh, Sarah and Chris clean out Chuck's apartment, and they uh, brought me this plant that was dilapidated, so neglected <laughs> and overgrown. And I said, this probably isn't worth anything, is it? And uh, I, I said, well, I'll take it. And, uh, and uh, there were all these shoots growing on it, and so I, I cut them all off and I rooted them. And uh, I've given a few to the men's group, and there's a few downstairs Feel free to take one if you'd like to. That's a dwarf Diefenbachia. Uh, you can keep that as a memory of Chuck if you like. Um, and, and Sarah and uh, Chris asked me if I wanted this book, Heart to Heart, which Chuck had for the men's group. And um, by Robinson and Hawkins, and he had marked this passage with friends we take the risk of knowing and being known. 
we continue to get closer to them, even though we know that there will be loss in our future. Chuck meant so much to our men's group, and he did so much to make this a great group. He was a founding member of our group seven years ago, and he became co-leader with Tom Woodrum six years ago. We've been a very close-knit group and uh, meeting with most members coming to ev almost every meeting, including two and a half years via Zoom during the pandemic. Tom passed away last May, so now we have lost both our leaders. In addition to losing Tom and Chuck, another of our members, Gene Seipel, lost his wife, Paula, last December. So our group has experienced so much loss in the past year. For the few, first few years leading, leading the, uh, the group, uh, Chuck and Tom did led every discussion. We all shared memories of growing up, our youth, and our college years. Then we started rotating leadership out of the discussion. Chuck welcomed discussion topics from other members with enthusiasm. When I said I wanted to have a discussion about the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which is an amazing story about suffering and surviving the Holocaust. Chuck was excited about it and sent along readings of his own for everyone to read on the subject of suffering being a part of life. Here are my own remembrances of Chuck, a couple of examples. Before Patricia and I went to Yellowstone a couple of years ago, I had a special coffee meeting with Chuck. And clearly his experiences in the outdoors at Yellowstone as a young adult was a highlight of his life. Chuck was a kind and loyal friend to me. Last summer when we were gone for two weeks in August, I asked him if he would water my plants, especially my new irises every other day. It was really hot while we were gone and when I asked him how it was going, he told me that he was watering all of them every day to make sure I didn't lose them. And indeed, they all survived. Thank you, Chuck. Some members of our uh, men's group asked me to share some memories of Chuck. Uh, Joe Thompson isn't able to be here today, but he's joining us by Zoom and asked me to say that he always appreciated having coffee with Chuck, always with genuine concern. He would ask probing and insightful, qu insightful questions throughout the conversation to her level, both when out for coffee and in our small group, men's group. He was also encouraging, he also was always encouraging us to share stories from our lives. Chuck sometimes talked about problems he had with past relationships. He learned and grew from these relationships. He regretted that he had hurt people. Chuck remained loyal to these people from his past. George Bedarian asked me to say that Chuck deeply valued trust and commitment and friendships. Chuck loved this UU community, as I think many people have shared this morning, this afternoon. And we saw this not only in his uh, contributions to the men's group, but participation in so many parts of this community. Shane McFarland asked me to say this. Chuck was a friend of mine and my unofficial fifth PhD committee member. He supported me with listening and milkshakes while my marriage dissolved. He listened while I expressed my trepidation around preliminary exams, told me based on our conversations that I had nothing to worry about with the exam. He told me embrace, to embrace both what I did know and what I did not know. He encouraged me to stay focused and be honest. Chuck is a true friend. He is still with me in spirit. Conclude, Chuck was uh, both my friend and a loyal member and leader of our men's group. His legacy is le leading this group to a place where we are stronger together. Chuck, we miss you so much. Thank you. Debbie? Thank you. 
it so. How's that? Okay. Debbie McLaughlin here. I uh, first met Chuck in 1984 when he came here to the University of Idaho with Chris and, and with, with some of the kids here. And um, as such, he came into to, uh, Bill's, Bill's department, my husband, so they've been colleagues. So for the next 25 or 30 years, you know, colleagues in, in the university setting, right? And so, and I really didn't really know Chuck that much, but it's often, you know, graduation parties or meet new student parties and uh, thesis defense parties, things like that. And so it was really a little bit maybe off to, off to the side. He was one of my husband's colleagues, right? Um, but one of the things, and, and Chuck was often there, uh, but one thing uh, that really that stays with me is um, my husband Bill taught research methods to every every fall to incoming graduate students. It was something everybody had to take at 7:30 in the morning, okay. And so one of the hallmarks of of that uh, course was the Halloween party, in which students were charged with they had to come, and faculty could if they wanted to. Uh, they had to come in costume, but as a concept from research methods. Okay, okay, so just imagine that, right? And they were always great fun. Boy, people would get creative, and Chuck always participated, you know, doing the whole thing. And, and I think the whole idea of, of doing, of, you know, grabbing the concept, how you're going to show it, the creativity and the humor that was always there. So at some point, everybody would stand up and, you know, show off and we, everybody would have to guess what the concept was. And so, so Chuck enjoyed those and had a good time with that. So, so that felt good. So then over the years, you know, everybody's progressing in their career, having kids and families and doing things and traveling, working on research projects and writing papers and getting tenure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, fast forward to about well, and then the retirement in there too. Fast forward to about 2018. My husband had passed away uh, and I started coming here to the Unitarian Church. This is the source of, of, of community and, and love that you really feel here. And that's when I started to reconnect with Chuck. He was coming, you know, irregularly and we would have little chats. And then um, eventually we had a coffee date that seems to be one of his hallmarks. They're not, I mean, that, that uh, have, sit and have coffee. And so, so we would get together occasionally for a cup of coffee. And I do remember one time when we had been talking, we were reminiscing. And we were going back in time to maybe children's antics, things like that. And maybe graduate students that had come through, you know, the Halloween party. And how much pleasure we both felt at that. And I could really feel that in him, that he seemed more relaxed and was, was, was really laughing. And that, that felt really good. So then fast forward another couple of years, and it's COVID, OK? And I uh, had to go look at my uh, history to, to remember how this was. But uh, so we would, we would be texting, and he was really affected by the isolation. I mean, I was too, but Chuck definitely more i mean we're cut off from our from you know the things that were keeping us going our get-togethers with our friends and and so he expressed how the, the isolation was hard plus i know he was having more and more pain and and treatments and things that were affecting him so um we would we would he would text me a, a link to a poem and i think it was mary oliver right and um and then, uh, you know, I would text him pictures of the Moose family traveling around town and, and flowers from my garden. And, and the one thing that I, that I take away from those times and that I see in the text messages, how generous he was with his gratitude. He really felt that it warmed me to know that, that what I, little I was doing was helping. So he often expressed his gratitude and I appreciated that and he still managed this wacky sense of humor that would come up even in the hard times and so you know he was good that way and and uh, I think uh, uh, you know expressed a little bit of resilience there that I think that was important 
So, um, so those are, and, and seeing his courage and deciding what he needed to do. Um, so anyway, go check. And in, in my imagination, I see Chuck and Bill, they're somewhere up in some greater over other dimension, and they're standing there and observing. And they're observing the recreational activities, the resource use in this, uh, what, the celestial plane. They are going to compile the information, analyze it, and write a report. So keep your antennas hooked in, okay, because they're going to be beaming it down, but probably in the form of a poem or a song. Peace. Thank you. I invite you now into a litany of remembrance. This is often how we close our memorial services here. Your part is really easy. You say we remember him. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember him. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember him. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, we remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember him. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember him. When we have joys we learn to share, we remember him. So long as we live, he too shall live, for he is now a part of us as we remember him. And then I wanted to give Chuck the last word. This meditation is one that he texted to me on the Sunday after he went into hospice and asked me to share with the congregation. Let this house be quiet. Let our minds be quiet. Let the quietness of the hills, the quietness of deep waters be also with us. So quiet that the noise of passing events and present anxieties, of random recollections and wondering thoughts is stilled. So quiet that the marvelous stillness is like music. So quiet that we feel the very being of the life that is us all. So quiet that we are renewed. We feel at one with all others at home in a tabernacle of stillness. So quiet that we sense the ripples of this pool of quietness and healing pass through us and out to the farthest star. Now I'll invite the choir forward to sing. Uh, this, this song is actually one that Chuck chose to talk about and share in a service about favorite music, so.
Thank you. Under the vast spiral of time and space, surrounded by the simple blessings of a community of care and love, we carry our memories of Chuck with us back to the community and the life he loved. We pray, grant us resilience, wisdom, and thanksgiving. Give us strength to speak of our lives so that each day yet to come we find more compassion, more understanding, more of the loving kindness that fills our world with joy and laughter. Give us courage to cherish one another so that we use our lives to heal instead of forget and lead ourselves to the possibility of forgiveness instead of defiance. In Chuck's honor, in his memory, may we go forth now and love life as fully as we are able. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. We're going to sing another of Chuck's favorite song called Blue Boat Home. Chuck tried his best. He was a good man, and he had a lot of love. May we go forth and do likewise. Go in peace. And go downstairs for treats. <laughs> <laughs>